just highlighted the word here where I thought we would pick up from. Well, I thought I did. No, I didn't know. Verse 5 there, five. and Abram took Sarai. Is there a different it, color? It's blue. Oh, it is. It, oh, okay. I was going to say, I thought I had it blue. It's not showing up terribly awesome there. <laughs> it's better back here, I think, than up there. Is it? Okay. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. Anyway, yeah. That's kind of where, because we spend a lot of time, you know, going through these tremendous blessings in the preaching of the gospel, you know, coming through that first section there. And so this time we'll look at verses 5 through the end and kind of break those down. Uh, would you like for me to read it for you? Uh, should we refresh ourselves? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. So here we go. Uh, Abram took Sarai his wife and Lot his brother's son and all their possessions that they had gathered and the souls whom they had acquired in Haran and they set out for the land of Canaan and they came to the land of Canaan and Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem as far as the plain or the tree oak maybe of Moreh at that time the Canaanites were in the land and Yuvah appeared to Abram and said to your seed I give this land and he built there a a slaughter place or an altar to Yovah who had appeared to him and from there he moved to the mountain east of Bethel and he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I or Hai on the east and he built there another slaughter place to Yovah and called on the name of Yovah and Abram set out continuing towards the south and a scarcity of food came to be in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to dwell there, for the scarcity of food was severe in the land. And it came to be, when he was close to entering Egypt, that he said to Sarai his wife, Behold now, I, s I know that you are a beautiful woman to look at, and it shall be, when the Egyptians see you, that they will say, This is his wife, and they shall kill me, but let you live. Please say you are my sister so that it shall be well with me for your sake, and my life be spared because of you. And it came to be, when Abram came into Egypt, that the Egyptians saw the woman, that she was very beautiful. And Pharaoh's officials saw her and praised her before Pharaoh, and the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. And he treated Abram well for her sake, and he had sheep and cattle and male donkeys and male and female servants and female donkeys and camels. But Yuvah plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not inform me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? And so I was going to take her for my wife. Look, here is your wife. Take her and go. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. So there we have the journey of Abram <clears throat> through the land of Canaan. Now, I wanted to start with this discussion, a brief discussion regarding this, this quote here in verse 5, um, that they left with the souls whom they had acquired. And that's literally what it says. I mean, you, you, some of your translations may say something slightly different. Does yours say something, anything different, Mike? Uh, persons they gained. The persons they gained. Okay. How about yours, Nathan? What does yours say? Uh, mine says the same. Uh, it's the young living. The young's literal. The literal is. Yeah, I was wondering at the archaic language, I was wondering if they were trying to soften the blow of slavery or servanthood there or if they're just trying to be super liberal. I yeah. Because they, they could have said man slaves. And, it does say that elsewhere. Well, in yeah, right. And, but in the Hebrew, it literally says souls they made. Right. Not acquired made. Not acquired made. made. Hayah, right? God made right. the lights. And right. That's a very curious phrase. Angela? Uh, the thing about slaves versus servants same word in Hebrew. Slave or servant? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's difficult for us because we have a connotation, our, our culture has a certain connotation attached to the word slave. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't 
believe that when we see the word slave in the Bible that we can do that because yeah. it's slave yeah. slash servant. Is yeah. Like, yeah. I would look at it as employee. Employees. Yeah, that's that's very yeah. true. Now and I do not think immediately of these people being abused and beaten. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the Torah has rules and regulations regarding, even if you did own a slave, you know, if you captured uh, somebody in battle and turned them into water bearers or chop wood choppers like the Israelites did in the book of, uh, you know, um, Judges, you know, when they, when they did not follow through with the instructions to exterminate the land of Canaan, but turn them into servants. Uh, yeah, I think that they did that. But the Torah gave pretty clear instructions about how you are to treat even slaves that you have. But I agree that most times in the, in the Torah and in the writings, that it is not our concept of slavery at all. It and is, there's a lot of criticism leveled at the Old Testament. There is. People who don't understand the Hebrew word. That's right. Saying, you know, yeah. that God approves of slavery, but right. you, you right. can't. And, and then he even tells you what you, that you can beat your slaves, and it's like, well, hold on a second. No, that's Because not... you, that's anachronistic. You're taking modern day. Right. You're taking the history of America day. for just a couple of hundred years right. ago and, and superimposing super it. it. Yeah, that's, that's being not... anachronistic. That is absolutely correct, and that you can't do that. And I think that you, you, that's a good study to do, to look at what the Bible says about servanthood. And it's more about indentured servitude or simple employment is oftentimes what is you know, talked about there. So, but in regards to these souls, literally in the Hebrew says souls that they made and uses the same word that God made this. So you've got two different words used if you remember back in the beginning of our Torah study here in Genesis that we have two different Hebrew words used for made. What is what? Haita and Haya? Is that what it is? No. Uh, Haya. Isn't that a Oh, that's it's to be. Like it's be. That is the, correct. It's the it came into be being. Or it came to pass, or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, I forgot. Is it? Oh, I totally spaced the word. The two words were creator made. Yeah. One is bara. One is uh, asa. Asa. Okay. This and one is asa, asa, right? Asa. Okay. Yeah. One is bara is create something out of nothing. Yeah. And asa is to create something using materials that are pre-existing. Do or make. Do or make, right. So what's curious here is that this says that the souls that they had acquired, it literally in the Hebrew says souls that they had made. Now what do you, what, how would you interpret that? So many people do interpret it as they got a bunch of servants. But I would it says it right down they here. Followers, that followers or they created a community maybe. That's a good interest. That's a good insight. It's interesting that they use the word he left with servants. I mean, they certainly, you know, Moses knew the word servants. He used it here at the, at the end of this section. He certainly could have used it up there if that's what he was talking about. Mike? I think it has to do with the gospel that he was given in the first few verses. Yeah. And what he shared with these people. Yeah. Um, I pointed out, I think, last week that in uh, the Sanhedrin. It says, it says, whoever teaches Torah to the son of his neighbor is credited by scripture as if he had made him. Mm -hmm. As it said, and the souls which they had made in Haram, Genesis 25. Yep. So yep. The, it seems like these <clears throat> sages were understanding this to be Abraham teaching this way of life to these people, and he brought them out. Yep. I think that that is. I think that that is my own interpretation, uh, and the, the, that is a very, very common rabbinic interpretation of what is going on here. That Abraham is basically preaching. We would look at it as Christians as he's preaching the gospel. Mm -hmm. Now he's just had the a good chunk of the gospel in a little nut nutshell preached to him, you know, from last week. But I think it's about teaching these pagans where he was from. These idols that you're worshiping and these false gods they are nothing they do not they cannot save you they cannot help you there is one god there is one true god and he hears and he knows all and he helps and he blesses and i think that that's exactly what it's talking about is he is actually in the hebrew if you look at some of the commentary uh, it actually talks about he is actually birthing souls creating yes. souls because I, and you know, I, it reminds me of some of the New Testament writings of Paul, 
which talks about us being dead in our sins and in our transgressions and that the natural man does not understand the things of God and that our souls need to be enlivened by the Spirit of God. That's kind of what it reminds me of is some of those New Testament passages um, where he is dealing with people who are dead inside and that he is basically giving them spiritual life by the Spirit of the, of the, of the Father teaching them the truth and their souls are being quickened by the Holy Spirit. Now I know that that might sound a little strange to some people who consider the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost and didn't exist before that, but I would beg to differ and think that it is obviously by the Spirit of God that, that men can only by the Spirit of God understand the things of God, right? Paul teaches us. Now do we think that it would be any different in the Old Testament than in the New? I don't think so. I don't think so. So I think it's really probably very true that he was actually birthing souls through the power of the Holy Spirit, converting people to the worship of the one true God. And those people followed him when he left his land. Go ahead. What you said reminded me of something else that Paul said in Galatians 4, which is interesting because that's another piece about Sarah and Hagar at the end mm. of that. Mm -hmm. But um, he's, he's talking to the Galatians and he said, My little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Yeah. So this is the idea of... It's like Paul giving birth to believers. Yeah. I and think that's a great a, connection. And parallel with Isaac in chapter 26 because as we'll read later, is Isaac does the same thing. He says tell them you're my sister, mm -hmm. and they go into a foreign land, and then God blesses them, and at the end of that little section it says, and Isaac sowed in that land, and a hundredfold was found in that year, yep. and Yahweh blessed him, and if we mm -hmm. know that the parable of the sower, the seed is the word of God, and at the end of that, the good soil brings forth, produces fruit, some 30, 60, 100, yeah. I think we're seeing another picture of, of what's actually happening in that. It's, yeah. They're creating going out and making disciples, if you will. Yep, yep. You know, so I think that that's, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, I absolutely. That way. And the fact that that same word is used for, in Genesis 1, for yielding fruit. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So Excellent. We're supposed yielding to... Yielding fruit after its own kind. Yeah, that right. word is saw, making fruit, yielding yep. fruit. I think that's a, it's an awesome way to look at Abraham as making disciples. And why wouldn't he? You know what I'm saying? This is the, 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 the author, uh, not the author, but the, uh, the progenitor of our faith, you know, that look to the rock from, from whom you were hewn. Well, we would naturally interpret that passage as the rock we were hewn is from the Messiah or God himself. But right after that, he says, look to Abraham, your father, and Sarah, your mother, who gave birth to you. So I think that, not that that's not to diminish from God our rock and Yeshua our rock, but Abraham is apparently in some way our rock, the, 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 the quarry from which we were dug as, as children of Abraham. Well, that's you know? just like all the way down to the New Testament talking about we are children of Abraham. Yeah. Well, if you were children of Abraham, you would know me. It's because his gospel is the gospel of the seed, yeah. the word, Messiah, yep. that through him all nations will be blessed. That is the gospel. That is, absolutely. So I think that that's absolutely what is going on here is that Abram is making souls and, uh, you know, making converts and gathering people to himself. I think we see that in the, the next chapters where he goes to war against those different kings uh, uh, to, to help rescue Lot who had been taken captive. It says he and 318 men of his household. I think these are some of his converts. Where do these 318 men come from? I think that's who was being referenced here, right there. Do you think they lived in a commune or type situation, a community where... Well, they all traveled together. Yeah, That's yeah. why him and Lot had to separate because they had too many possessions, too many people. Right. The land couldn't hold them all. Right. Yeah. I think there's... And I'm, I'm glad you brought that mm -hmm. up because I want to talk about that. I think there's some interesting things going on between him and Lot here that we'll discuss in a few minutes. It's curious to me. I don't know. We'll see. Perhaps they, uh, you know, if you read the beginning of verse 12, it says, Jehovah told Abraham to leave. Hmm. So, you know, I, I know if I was living in a community and uh, God told somebody to leave, I might go with them. Hmm. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. well, God told him to leave. Because it says here that Lot accompanied him. And looking at the name of this community they're living in, it's called Haran, 
which is one of Abram's brothers. Mm-hmm. You know, there, mm-hmm. it's Abram. I, I was just reading it in chapter eleven. It's yeah. Abram, Nahor, and Haran. It's actually spelled differently though, so I thought the same thing. Yes, I did too. Oh, is, yes, yeah. uh, one is a het. A hay. And one is a hay. His brother's a hay, and, and the hay. town is a het. Well, yeah. It's Although the English says, translation both just says Haran. It says that Terah and the whole family left Ur of the Chaldees right. to go in the direction of Canaan. Right. And they resided in. It, in my translation, it just says. Well, in yours, it just says Haran. In mine, it does have the ch, the ch, Haran, mm-hmm. or something. And we talked about that last week when we were looking at the maps, and there is some contention that Haran actually is part of the land of Canaan, although in the most northerly part. But, it, it, but there is some debate about whether that is actually part of the land of Canaan. But, you know, God says, leave this thing, this thing and I will take you to a new place. So in a sense, no. In a sense, yes. It's kind of interesting. Well, as I read, I just wonder if they, they, began, if they started that town, if that town is just mm. their family. That's certainly it, interesting, yeah. Because it says, go from thy kindred. From mm-hmm. the house that mm-hmm. father, so you know, I mean, it doesn't have to be a kind yeah. of pre-existing community. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting too when uh, when Abram is looking for a, a wife for his son Isaac, that he sends them to Padam Aram, which is where his family is, which I would assume is the same place as Haran, because it doesn't we don't we aren't told that they relocated, but the name changes somehow from Haran to Padam Aram. Which was interesting because Padam Aram, or Padam Aran, is the Aramean place, which is Syria, which is just where Haran is. And so I think it's the same place, but the name has changed somehow. I don't know why. Something was important about this family, and they were trying to keep something in the family. Yeah. I was reading eleven that his brother Nahor married a daughter of Haran, mm. Milka. Mm-hmm. So he mm-hmm. also married his niece, niece or something like that. Niece? Yeah, yeah. Um, and Abram married his half sister or something. So yeah, that's a big mystery regarding who in the heck is uh, how is Sarah related to him. We I have looked through a bunch of literature in that regard, and I can't find anything that is definitive. The rabbis will sometimes try to defend Abram by saying she really was kind of his sister from, uh, you know, maybe a different mother or something. Maybe she was a, a daughter of one of his brothers. Uh, maybe he's just speaking figuratively, like Tracy is my sister because we're part of the same fellowship group. There, you know, there's a diff- bunch of different ways to look at it. say we share the same something but not the same something? Yeah, the same father but not the same mother. I yeah. said, well, if you look at that spiritually, it's interesting because we, we all share the same father. Oh, right. You know? So could he be saying something oh, like that? Yeah, could be. Well, that would be could definitely be. better for the genetic code. If sure. We the, if it were the heavenly father. Well, yeah, and you know what, Nathan, yeah. something that you mentioned just a minute ago, which I thought was kind of interesting, and it occurred to me, that there may potentially be a chiasm mm-hmm. in this section where you've got Abram leaving his father's house, but a mixed multitude comes with him. Then when they leave Egypt, another mixed multitude leaves with them. So and the then servants they, may not be the souls, perhaps. Well, it, it, so a mixed multitude perhaps in the sense of the souls that they took, but also cousin Lot, you know, nephew Lot. Well, he's not a servant. Lot's no, not a servant. No, he's not. He was a not. soul that came with him. Yeah, Vermont. that's true. And so, you, but you've got these other souls who are kind of like you could say a mixed multitude of people who had been converted or decided, like you said, hey, God spoke to you and said you to leave. I'm going God's with you. Story, you know? not well, that's exactly what happens in the story when they leave Egypt. And we know that this here that happens at the end is definitely a prophetic shadow picture of that because there's just way too many textual connections. So it's kind of interesting that you have them leaving here and taking some people with them, them leaving here and taking some people with them, and then the exodus. I would just wonder if there's some connections between those three things. It might be something to look at, you know. And also, too, I think we talked about a couple weeks ago, is the land of Ur is in Babylon. So yeah. I think the big picture here is he's calling them out of Babylon. Right. And that's our pattern that we see consistently yeah. in Scripture. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, um, so you know, what we should probably learn from this is that we need to be about the business of making souls as well. 
you know, that's definitely is something that I would take away from this is that we should definitely be in the business of making souls and uh, doing such by leaving Babylon and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, showing people the true path and being gentle and kind about it and, you know, not hitting people over the head with our Bibles or using a bullhorn or whatever, but just leading by example, teaching people the truth as much as we can. Um, now, I want to talk next about this little journey, these way places, these stops that Abram makes and his movement through the land of Canaan and what potential significance there might be to these things. So I'm going to move forward just a little bit to this little map that I have created. It's not my base map, but I added the stuff on it. So you can see that he left northern Syria up here in Haran and came down to the place of Shechem in the plain of Moreh and then left there and went to pitch his tent between Bethel and Ai perhaps and then left there and went down to the Negev desert. The Negev is obviously a lot larger than that little circle that I created there but it's down here and then from here off to Egypt. Now I'm going to go um, back to the text and kind of look at it. Let's look at some of these place names and what happens there and begin to maybe f try to figure out is there spiritual significance to these places and what happens there and is something changing as he's traveling along. Number one he first lands in Shechem slash Moray. Now we know that Shechem means shoulders between the shoulder blades or something like that and that Moray is teacher. So in the first place that he went to here in Shechem, God appeared to him there and reiterated the promise of uh, to this land I will give your descendants and Abram built an altar there. Okay, so now I think it's we want to pay attention to the fact that A, the place names, B, he, God actually appeared to him there, spoke to him one more time, and he built an altar. Okay, now next he leaves there and j begins to journey south. And he lands between Bethel and Ai. Now those words mean Bethel is the house of God and I is a heap, often interpreted as a heap of ruins. Now it says that he built an altar and called on the name, but God did not appear to him there. God did not speak to him. Not, I'm not attaching significance to it necessarily, but just looking at the pattern, he did build an altar, and he called the name of God, but God did not speak. God did not reiterate any promises or appear to him there. Then he goes to the further south, to the Negev. Now, the, the, this is from an, unroot, uh, an unused Hebrew root meaning parched. And that totally makes sense. It's a desert. It's, it's a very nasty desert, a very dry desert. It literally means parched. An unused Hebrew root meaning parched. Which one is that? Uh, Negev. Because yeah, that, that's what I have for Haran as well, meaning parched. Mm, interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And I think that there's some wisdom there. And I want to I talk about that just a little bit. And that makes sense because of what I, what, what I was uh, thinking in this regard. So... There's a famine in that land, in the Negev, and so he has to move further south. Now, finally, he lands in Egypt, which we know that Mitzrayim, or Egypt, means double constriction or something like that, a double straits between a rock and a hard place, I think, if you want to look at it that way. And here, his life is in danger, and he has to, uh, we have this problem with his wife and whether he's lying or whatever, we'll have to kind of discuss that. But I want to I want to bring to your attention those things that I just pointed out. I think lead to a potential 
spiritual conclusion that we can draw. Now, I'm going to take one position, and I'm, I'm going to suggest to you that Abram screwed up here, that Abram did not do what was right. Now, Mike has a different idea, and he, I think he'll share that with us in a little bit. It's not that they contradict each other necessarily, but that you have a, a little bit of a different insight into this. And I think that what is happening here is, you know, Abram came from the land of Haran, which Tracy has just pointed out is parched. It's a, it's a wilderness kind of desert area. And the Negev, also meaning parched, those two places are similar, right? In topography, in arid, aridity, the, you know, the nature of the land. But what do you know about Shechem and Bethel and Ai? What do you, what do you know about those places? Have you seen any, um, well, we know, we know that they're in the, in the northern part of Israel, not up near the Sea of Galilee, but in the hill country of Ephraim, essentially. What are you thinking about the, um, the climate of those areas? High desert. It's a high desert, yeah. It's definitely not the, the low part of the desert. You, you, I can tell you for a fact that rainfall is way more up yeah. north. It is incredibly dry down here, and they don't get a lot of rain. But there's quite a bit of rain up in the north. In fact, that's you know the, the head of the Jordan River is up there. But it, it, someone suggested that as Abram came from Haran, a parched place, that he landed in Shechem and God appeared to him. He built an altar and God appeared to him. This to me would be a fortuitous sign. This is great. This is where God sent me. This is a, uh, this is, you know, God appeared to me. He Did really- Did God speak to him first and then he built an altar? That's a good question. Um, if you look at the text, says that he went through the land as far as the place of Shechem, uh, the plain of Moreh, the Canaanites were in the land, and God appeared to Abram and said, to your seed I give this land, and he built an altar there. So then he went to Bethel and Ai and built a slaughter place, but God did not appear. He called in the name of Yovah, but there was no appearance of God. And then there was a famine. And then there was a famine. Well, it doesn't say that there was a scarcity of food until he continued to head out towards the south. Which to me, I'm thinking to myself, well, duh, it makes sense that there would be a scarcity. He's heading into a parched land. Mm -hmm. He's heading into the Negev Desert. That is a parched area where a famine, uh, not very much water, it's just a given. Where, but somebody suggested, I don't remember exactly who it was that I was reading, that Abram did not feel terribly comfortable in this area up north because he wasn't used to it. The land of Ur of the Chaldees is also very dry and parched. Haran is very dry and parched. The Negev is very dry and parched. Someone has suggested that perhaps Abram was looking for something familiar, that he was heading towards the south, the desert, because he was looking for something that he felt a little more comfortable with, a land that he just felt more at home in. Because this hill country of Ephraim is not like that. Now, I don't know whether that's true. That's entirely speculative. Although well, they're living in tents. So yeah. I imagine that'd be pretty cold if you weren't living in a dry area. Sure, that is all, yeah, that is definitely true. Well, but you got a lot of rain going on up here, a lot of foliage, but down here there's not. So it just, it, it makes sense to me that as you head further south and you get toward the Negev Desert, it, there's going to be a famine. There, there's going to be a really dry. I mean, you're missing the point, but it just, um, he told him to go out of his land to, to the land where he will show you. So, mm -hmm. I, in my mind, Abram's continuing to move forward until God tells him to stop. Well, God never told him to go any further, and God never told him to stop anywhere. But what's the land he will show him? To me, when I read this, when he landed in Shechem, and God appeared to him and says, this, to this land I will give you, well, why wouldn't you just assume it's this land right here? Mm -hmm. they, he I thought stopped? it was Canaan. Was it, am I off? It no, the whole thing is Canaan. The whole thing is Canaan, okay. But so my point, that's the, I get that, and I should have made, maybe made that a little clearer. When he first arrived at Shechem, God appeared to him and said, to this land I will give 
I, I will give this land to your descendants. So why wouldn't he just stay right there? Why continue journeying further towards the south? And I think that looking at when he does begin to journey towards the south, A, he's pitching his tent between Bethel and Ai, which, which to me suggests a spiritual principle that you are living between the house of God and a heap of ruins. This is decision time. Wow. I'm seeing this as decision time. Testing of faith, what are you gonna do? Well, you see what happens when he gets to Egypt, then what happens in Egypt? He gets kicked decision out. Decision time, again. When he gets kicked out, he, he goes south, south, south to Egypt. He does something, Pharaoh gets mad at him, tells him to, get, to leave. Mm -hmm. And where does he leave to? Goes right back he to where back. he came from. To where? Bethel and Ai. Oh. And I think that that's for a good reason as well, because I think that in this area is where God intended him to be. And that's where he stays. That's where he's buried. But I think that if you want to theorize that he was looking for a land that was a little bit more comfortable for him, you know, dwelling in his tents, a little more warm, I don't know. But what I do see is a potential spiritual principle where, he, where I'm looking at he showed up here in Shechem, and God appeared to him, said, to this land I give your descendants. But then he began to move. God didn't tell him to leave. God didn't also tell him to stay. But if, God, if you go someplace and God appears to you and says, to this land I will give you your descendants, I'd be staying right there. I don't so, know why I would move. I don't want to jump too far ahead, but you got some interesting dialogue in the next chapter, like when they separate. And yes. where are they when that happens? They're in Bethel, right? Right. And so Lot takes off towards Sodom. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say Abraham went anywhere. Right. And God says, look out all yeah. around you and right. walk the breadth of this land. This yes. It's all going to be yes. your place. But they're in Bethel when that conversation's happening. Right? My understanding, yes. That is my understanding is that's okay. exactly where it happened. And then God did say, arise, walk the length of the land, you know. Every place the foot of your... And part of what we consider Egypt is part of that. I would assume so. Yeah. Land. I believe so. It seems like time and again we're being drawn back to this place, this Bethel, the Shechem area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a significantly important place. This I totally agree. To, to the two mountains are Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, evil. My question is why? What's the difference between this land and Jerusalem? That's a good question. That when is I study this, I'm going, this is the place. You know, yeah, but yeah. I don't know. I mean, I'm probably missing something. But. Well, that is, and you know what's interesting too, um, and you will find that there, the the <laughs> Beth El is mentioned many times in the Bible, but in different places. Yes. So people, Bible scholars, are a little confused. Okay, wait a minute. Is there more than one Beth El? Are we? Do we have textual clues which kind of lead us to different conclusions about where it is? I don't know. But I think what's, what happens at those places is leading us to, uh, this is a spiritual destination. Mm -hmm. Don't take it so literally as, yeah. you know, oh my goodness, there appears to be one here and there also appears to be one here. There certainly could be, but I think it's a spiritual destination. I noticed some interesting things in some of the, the city names and how they describe certain things that there's their direction, mm -hmm. like Negev also can mean south. Oh. Right. right, right. And then this, I think some some translations will uh, say like uh, is it east, but this says is translated as sea, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, and stretched his tent with Bethel towards the sea, yeah, um, towards this way. Right. That's why I kind of wondered like when he's between Bethel and I. If I, this trash heap is at his back, and his tent is pitched towards the house of God. Yeah, yeah, I think, it, and I saw in the thing that you uh, sent me that you were talking about the orientation and how it kind of represented the orientation of the tribes of Israel and also the orientation of the temple and the, mm -hmm. the, uh, the tabernacle. I think that's a curious, uh, curious parallel there, like which the might. Of the yeah. Would be used as point to the east. Right. 
Right. Glad to see you there. And so that yeah, that Abram see. would be pitching his tent somewhere here with his back to I and his, you know, facing maybe the door of his tent faced towards the house of God. I'm not sure. That's I think it's prob it probably was a habit of people to uh, face their doors to the east. I know that I don't I don't know you said the tabernacle was. Well, like the entrance is on the east. Right. So like if the door facing it, they would be facing west. Right. But the entrance to the tabernacle would, would be, be facing, facing east. east. Right. Right. I, so I the think, men approaching the temple would have their backs toward the east. Toward the east. Right. Yeah. And I think there's something in one of the prophets, is it Ezekiel or mm -hmm. Jeremiah, where it's like all the men are have their backs turned to the temple, and that was some yeah, kind of atrocious. The sun. They're facing the sun. It's like the 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 implication seems to be they're worshiping gods of the east or worshiping yeah. the sun or something like that. It's an easy way to tell the month as well when you when you have a doorway that's facing directly to the yeah, east. Yeah, sure. The, the full moon rises directly in the east. Yeah, true, so, true. So if you have a doorway that opens to the east, the light will, as the night comes, the light will mm -hmm. flood in and have like a perfectly direct yeah. moonlight. So, yeah, that's yeah, pretty cool. That word, um, that word west in verse 8 is young and it's like it can mean sea mediterranean sea seaward westward mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so it's yeah. kind of interesting well if he's pitching his tent between bethel and ai then bethel would be seaward yeah. so i don't know how you want to interpret that i mean i i uh I heard um, Grant Luton actually talk about this, and I thought he made an, an excellent point. He, you know, he's like, he asked his own congregation, why didn't he just pitch his tent at Bethel? Mm -hmm. And he came, his own suggestion was, you can't. That is not the way things work. You wake up every day between Bethel and Ai. When you, you said that, I was thinking, that's where we are now. That's, that's where we are now. You yeah, knew yeah. that is your destination eventually and ultimately is to reach the house of God. But every day that you wake up, you are having to wake up between the house of God and a heap of ruins. And yeah. it's up to you which way are you traveling. Are awesome. you heading towards the house of God or are you heading towards the heap of ruins? It reminds me of the Gehenna. Oh, my, this heap of mm -hmm. this burning heap a burning that, trash heap, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's related or not, but it seems... You could interpret it that way, that heaven and hell, or the burning trash heap, the fires yeah. of Gehenna or whatever, and the house well, of God. that makes sense. Heaven and, and Gehenna is it does. translated as yeah. hell. Yeah, absolutely. So that's, so that's kind of the way I'm looking at this, is that this is where Abram begins to be tested. This is where the test begins, and I think that's why the place names seem to suggest that, that he is at a decision point, that he's like, I think that he has moved a little bit away from where God intended him to be, which is in Shechem, where God appeared to him and gave him a blessing. <coughs> then he goes to Bethel and I, and it's like, okay, it's decision time, buddy. You are between the house of God and the burning trash heap. What are you going to do now? I think he makes a further mistake and heads south towards the parched land. And then he began to, God, remember, God never told him to go anywhere. And I think that what happens here is that he is leading himself in a direction which he probably shouldn't have gone. And he sees salvation in Egypt. That is not the place of salvation. In fact, he recognizes that in his own words saying, these people are evil. They're going to recognize that this woman is my wife and they're going to kill me, and they're going to let her live. Okay, so I'm seeing this as Abram is moving off of the path where he should be headed towards, where he should have stayed. He should have stayed right where God put him. Instead, he began to move further and further south until he got himself in trouble and began to see Egypt as his place of salvation. Egypt does seem to be a place, though, where testing does take place and where you do become humble. Yeah, and I think that, you know, I don't want to say necessarily, I, because, and this is where it gets a little, tr a little troublesome, because you want to say, well, isn't this part of God's plan? I mean, there's so many spiritual principles that are involved here in this text, and I would say, absolutely. And I, I mean, you can probably see that in your own life, that, what, yeah, we make stupid mistakes. We do have free will, and we will make stupid mistakes, and that's the glory of God, that 
we will learn and grow and it will fulfill his prophetic vision and everything works according to his perfect plan even though we have free will and screw stuff up all the time. So I think that was that part of the plan? Well, I don't know. It sure seems that way. But it's definitely a test for him when he goes to, I mean, I thought to myself, this is what kind of got me thinking about this. Why would he say, go to the land of Canaan that I will show you, I'm going to give this to your descendants, and then cause a famine to come upon the land? That seems really weird. And I began to think, well, if he had maybe stayed up here where God told him to be, maybe the famine wouldn't have been quite so difficult. Maybe there would have been a little bit of rain up there, and he could have weathered the storm. I don't know. But what I do see is some language in these place names and what happens there that leads me to believe that he's moving in the wrong direction and he's being tested each step of the way. And when he gets down here, it doesn't definitely doesn't get better. We got a famine kicking in in a pretty heavy way, but he instead of saying, "I'm going to go back to where God appeared to me and where he told me to be, you know, in the beginning." Because that's what happens when everything gets screwed up in Egypt. He goes right back to where he was in the beginning. Well, one other possible interpretation <clears throat> is there there is actually something good that came out of Egypt. He got rich. You know, he went. He basically went down to Egypt. It says here he got sheep, that is true. oxen, donkeys, that is true. Sir, male servants, female servants. And you know what, Nathan? Yes. You know what I think also he got is rich that and back. that is the next test. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's interesting that after he leaves Egypt with all these riches, he goes right back to between Bethel and Ai. And here is the next test that arrives. It is the test of what's he going to do with Lot. How's he going to behave with Lot? That, I think, is the next test. Uh, who's, who's getting excited over there? Me. Almost <laughs> just two minutes. That's totally okay, good. No, that's cool. Just, uh, we'll go with Tracy. Yeah, I, yeah, go yeah, ahead, Tracy. Yeah, yeah. I'm just saying that there's a pattern here, too, with the whole Egypt thing, with him needing to go into Egypt for yeah. whatever reason. But the famine kind of struck me because that is Jacob and his yeah. his family were having a famine where they were living and sent mm -hmm. the sons into Egypt for seed. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. It's it's interesting with that parallel. But then again, the, the story of Isaac in Genesis 26, there, it says, Genesis 26, 1, that there was a famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham, which is this one. Mm -hmm. And Isaac went unto Abimelech, king of Philistines, unto Gerar, and the Lord appeared unto him, and said, do not go into Egypt. Dwell in the land which I shall tell you. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, there might be something worth looking at there. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that's when he says, I will multiply seed to you and all this mm -hmm. spiritual yeah. connotation yeah. kind of thing. But and I think that you could go back to God is able to work out his glory even in the midst of our stupidity. Mm -hmm. because but I think it's interesting. He told, him, he told him not to go into Egypt. He didn't tell yeah. him not to for whatever reason. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I think the location is different, though, too, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. So that's in Gerar, which is in, like, that's all, that's like in the promised land. Yeah, well, right? yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, Abimelech, as far as I remember, when that happened with um, Isaac, is in this same area where Abram was at the beginning. Yeah. So now you've got... Now we've got to figure out what in the heck happened with Abram. Why did he concoct this story about it with Sarai being his sister? And, you know, what was that all about? It, it, I, we, we're not going to be able to figure out, was she actually his sister? You can search that until you're blue in the face and you're just not going to find the answer to what you're looking for. Well, you think that, that's a possibility? It, you know, it is a and certainly... It is certainly a possibility that they were sisters in some sense, whether it's a fellowship, she's mm -hmm. my sister kind of thing, or hey, she actually is my niece, mm -hmm. or maybe she's my cousin. Uh, maybe there is a part in the scripture we talked about a minute ago which says that she is the, yeah, she is the, uh, you know, the, the daughter of my father but not my mother or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there is that possibility. But the fact of the matter is I don't think, and this is just my opinion, that we can absolve him of his obfuscation simply because he was technically correct by saying she's actually my sister, you know, technically she was. Ah. Maybe she was technically his sister, but where was he placing his trust to save his life? In, in his wife 
and in his concocted plan to well, lie. In his, in his cunning there, you know, he, he thought he would be killed. He did. He probably wasn't wrong that, that he was putting himself in danger. That yeah, is no, certainly... That protects the people that... Exactly. God right. does protect those, and especially since he already knows God's promise mm -hmm. to multiply this seed. Yeah. When he's in this position, what do you think God's going to do to those people? I think the punishment is much worse for attempting to kill Abraham than exactly. to take his wife and treat him well. Sure. Right. You know, he might. This might have been. This might have been a, a mercy. Yeah. Well you, think, well, you could look at where the punishment was placed too. Abraham was not punished for this. Egypt was. Mm -hmm. True. True. But Egypt was punished because they didn't recognize the one true God, right? In the next story, they just yes. Couldn't do it. Uh, yeah. Right. Eventually. Now, Angela, do you have something that you want to share that has to do with what we're talking about right now? Do you want us to move forward a little bit with the no, discussion? No, don't move forward. Don't move forward. Okay. Well, should we can yeah. we talk a little bit more? Are you you ready to rock? I, I kind of yeah. I what do you got? I see you've I been working. Really you've been working furiously on something. I know, really? with a chiasm, <laughs> and I saw it in the in the list of animals. Um, really. The yeah. list of animals. Okay, so we're we're reading along and all of a sudden it says and he had in the middle of the story it says and he had sheep, ox, and he asses and then slaves, girl slaves, she asses and camels. Did you, you notice that, that it says people in the middle of that and then goes back to animals? <laughs> Did you think it was weird? I thought that was weird, yeah. Where it was? Yeah. Did you think it was weird that it said he asses and then she asses? I did. That men yeah. slaves and girl slaves? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you take that as the center of the chiasm and you follow it out for the rest of the chapter. Um, okay, here we start with the men and the girl slaves. That's the center, I think. I don't mm -hmm. know. And then we have uh, he asses and she asses. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then go out and you have camels and the sheep and the oxen, which in the text are actually linked in the Hebrew with a mm -hmm. hyphen. Okay, then you have on the other on the outsides of that you have uh, that Pharaoh treated Abraham well. And here you have the plates coming on Pharaoh, and Pharaoh saying, what have you done to me? So Abraham is not treating Pharaoh well, but Pharaoh is mm. treating Abraham well here. Mm. Okay, go to the outsides of that. He says, Pharaoh says, I was taking her for my wife. And on the outside of that up here, Sarah was taken into Pharaoh's house. Okay, and then go up one more, and it says they, that when they came in, they were seeing the woman was beautiful. Well, Pharaoh says right here to Abraham, see your wife. Behold your wife. Mm -hmm. And then if you go below here, it says Abraham was sent away from Egypt. And on the other side up here, Abraham came into Egypt. Okay? On, prior to that, there was a famine. Well, after he was sent away, he went to the Negev, where it was parched. So you have your link to famine. Go up here, you have that he called on Jehovah. There was no answer at that time. That was after he'd gone south. Down here, uh, he camped between Bethel and Ai. That's the, that's where he was camped when he called on Jehovah. So prior here, you have camped at Bethel and Ai, and here you have camped at Bethel, Bethel and Ai. If you go above here, where he, before he camped at Bethel and Ai, you have him going the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. And if you go below in this story, the next thing happening is a lot going the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Above here in this story, Jehovah appears and promises the land to his seed. Here, Jehovah appears and promises it to his seed, and he specifies in every direction this time to the mm -hmm. north, to the north, to the south, to the east. So. And this one, this ends at the Oaks of Thornbury, where this happens, and this begins at the Oaks of Thornbury. So I think there might be a tie, does there? I think. <laughs> so what, remind me again. It, it, it's, a, it's a structure, a literary structure, okay. where it, it works its way like this. Yes, I got that part. So you got A, B, C, so that's C, B, the, A. That's the, the center is supposed to be the... the, the so the what idea, is the at the center idea. of this chiasm and what do you think it means? Men and girls slaves. You know, we were talking about oh, the yeah. souls he's making. Well, in spite of his decision to go the wrong direction, out of Egypt comes many souls in this whole nation of Israel, right? Later? Mm -hmm. Okay, so in spite of our decision to go the wrong direction, 
God is going to take us right back to where he intended us to be. And in the process, Souls are made. he's going to make a blessing in spite of your stupidity. Mm -hmm. I think I think is what he's saying. <laughs> Did you just write that while we were doing all yeah. this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty amazing. That's pretty cool. Triasms <laughs> are hard to find and hard to see. I think that was actually that. actually a pretty good one. Yeah. Uh, well, it's got to be real. I mean, it's a, I can see where she saw that coming in verse... Uh, 16 because why would it say he I, his yes. servants, handmaids, and she asks, why do they why did they split why the did they split the animals, yeah, split the split the animals and with men in between? Is when you right. see something that doesn't belong that's weird like that, it, it it's the clue to point you to you need to start puzzling this out and figure mm. out you what about the the deal. To the bank. I think that's a very interesting insight. Mm -hmm. I had not seen that. It just occurred to me but when I started knew, looking at uh, the mom Ray appearing twice and him camping between yeah, and just, and and twice. She sure. knew it was there. Mm -hmm. sure. Very cool, man. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Very interesting indeed. Uh, I have one so or two things to mention. You pl yes, please, please do. Um, it's just interesting to see plagues, plagues in Egypt. So it, yeah, right. don't go there just yet. We're okay. going. We're going to jump on that wagon here in just a sec. Okay. And one <laughs> other thing is that so after this play, Pharaoh confronts Abram, saying, and he knows what's wrong. Yes. He knows what Abram did wrong. How yeah. Do you know what Abram did wrong. I think maybe Mike. Do you have something on that, Mike? The, the word of Sarai. On which one? But how it is that Pharaoh knew. Did you, you want to talk about that? I think Mike was going to address that just a little bit. Yeah, a good question, though. Well, it, it reminds me of um, Jonah when they know something's wrong on the yes, ship. Yes, they just don't know They what. know, and they drew uh, lots. They drew lots. Yeah, yeah. And the lots fell on, on Jonah. They're like, okay, something's wrong. <laughs> One of us. And then it's like, it's you. Mm -hmm. It's just, uh, it's, it's interesting these yeah. ways. And that was a man who went the wrong direction. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Which is also a reference to this. Yeah, that's very cool. Um, the way they figure things out is just kind of fascinating. Yeah, it's certainly, certainly interesting. Um, so I will, I will just briefly speak, and then I want to turn a little bit of time over to Mike to have him discuss a couple of his ideas. Uh, I would say, um, First, Abram is right where he should be, and God appears, and he makes a slow, steady progression further away from God, and things get more ominous and more difficult, uh, culminating in his life being in danger to the point where he has to concoct a lie to save his own skin. Uh, Abra is Abraham a blessing to Pharaoh? Not exactly. No, he's not. Um, he brings a curse and plagues on Pharaoh because of Pharaoh's own behavior, but he definitely didn't bless Pharaoh. Does Pharaoh bless Abram? Well, this is questionable. Yes, he did get a bunch of wealth, but remember who came along with the wealth? Hagar. That's a questionable blessing to this day. So uh, Abram does get rich, but at what cost? The riches must have been small comfort as the Egyptians are taking his wife away. We think he's happy. He's like, oh, hey, you, this is your sister? Great. Uh, let's make a deal, you know. I, I, I'll give you a dowry. Is he feeling good about all of this stuff he's getting as they're taking Sarai to the house of Pharaoh? I can't imagine that that would be the case unless he's actually pimping her out. Yeah. Did you know there was some rabbi who actually suggested that Abram did pimp out his wife? I thought that's ridiculous, but yeah. whatever. Angela, did you have something? Well... And then the riches led to his parting with Lot. I think, yeah, there's a good and case to be made there. I, I think, you know, in this world, we see riches as a blessing automatically. But really, really. They can be. I mean, look what happens to people who win the lottery. Yeah. It destroys every one of them. It's not a blessing. It's not, yeah. They think it is. And it's okay to have money, but Yeshua does say you cannot serve God in money. And I can tell you from experience myself that it is real easy to begin worshiping money. Well, it really all sorts of problems with it. Yeah. Like, it, yes. His dispute with love. That is, uh, yeah, absolutely correct. It would have been a grave sin for him to actually give his wife away. Like, if that were, were to have actually gone through, yeah. hmm. if uh, Sarah had become, you know, so 
Perhaps he just knew. Perhaps he knew Sarai was his boomerang because he does this twice. That is, but I think that's part of Mike's contention, and we're going to let Mike address that in just a sec. Also, note that these great herds and flocks of Abraham and Lot, because of the cause of the strife between these brothers when they do get back to the land. Uh, so what do we learn from this? I think that perhaps we should learn that God, when he tells us to do something, we should do just that and nothing more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, stay where you're put until he tells you to go somewhere else. As we move further and further away from the instructions, things get more and more complicated and more and more dangerous. We have to begin to rely on ourselves and we'll create all kinds of machinations to save ourselves and these ill-laid plans always backfire and cause trouble. We may seem to be blessed in spite of our reckless decisions, but really are we? That is my final consideration in regards to this section. Now, Mike has an interesting couple of points that he'd like to make, and maybe a different little idea, a little spin on this. Um, Mike, you want to take it away for a few minutes and see what you got there? I can try. <laughs> I'm going to sit close to you because you're a soft talker. <laughs> and Trace, feel free to jump in because mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm going to remember all this mm -hmm. stuff. But when I was looking at some of this, we just got done kind of understanding Abraham being entrusted with this gospel and he's creating these souls and then all of a sudden within the same chapter he's credited <coughs> to having a complete lack of faith and messing up completely. I know that's not always a unique thing. We see that in scripture but it was just kind of difficult for me to pin down. And I can see, I definitely can see what you're pointing out, and it makes sense that way too. But uh, as I was looking at his journey through, um, I think we already pointed out that when he starts up in Shechem and um, uh, More, right, that those that word More, uh, you had pointed out as teacher, also means like to throw water, rain. Um, I think the root is archer. So there's definitely some pictures of the Torah mm. in that mm -hmm. word, right? In the root of that word. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then he drops down into Bethel, Bethel and I, and I kind of, from looking at the word, uh, the words being described and some of them mean west and some of them mean north and south, it, it kind of looked like this picture that his tent was facing towards the sea, which means he would be facing towards Bethel. And if Bethel is a representation of the house of God, like um, you have the garden and then you have um, the uh, tabernacle, and both of those entrances are on the east side, so he'd be kind of facing that east side with I, the trash heap at his back. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know if there was any significance there. Um, I can see what you're saying about him going into this parched land and there being, you know, uh, a famine there, and that might not have been the the best route for him. Um, I wanted to point out too in verse seven where it says, uh, "Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, to your seed I will give this land.'" That we see that same reference um, in Galatians about one seed and eight seeds as mm -hmm. many. Mm -hmm. So I'm, that's a good insight. Yeah, absolutely. That's where that's coming from. Yeah, you mentioned, uh, if I can, Mike, and I can ask a question, I hope you don't mind. Uh, you had mentioned that you saw maybe Abram's prevarication as a bit of protection for Pharaoh. That maybe Abram realized that you, you had to put a, maybe a little different spin on why Abram had prevaricated and told this story to, to, to uh, Pharaoh. T talk to me a little bit about that and what you, perception you had there. Uh, maybe just in the consequences for Pharaoh and his people. I mean, we do see, like, um, you know, pointed out the, the similar plagues happening just like we see in, in Egypt, right? Like, how much worse would it have been? Um, how much worse would it have been if Pharaoh had attempted to kill him and take Sarah? Because you know, then the blessing and the curse would have come upon him. Right. Yeah. And Abraham knows these blessings and curses are real thing, right? And it's he does, but he hasn't like quite it. experienced them yet. I think this might be his first experience of them. Well, can I say something about that? Yeah. Please. Um, the reason why I, I tend to think more along those lines is because of chapter 20, when Abraham does it again. Mm -hmm. He sends mm -hmm. his wife and say, you're my sister. 
and this time we get a little bit more insight. Mm -hmm. It says um, in chapter 20, um, okay, Abraham moved from there. He said, with, he's in Gerar this time, and he says, uh, she is my sister. And so this time it's Abimelech, the king of Gerar, who took Sarah just like Pharaoh did. But God came to Abimelech in a dream and told him, Behold, you are about to die because of the woman you have taken, she being married to a husband. And Abimelech had not come near her. And he said, O oh Lord, will you even slay a righteous nation? Because he hadn't done anything. So, did he not say to me, she is my sister? See, she, he told me, she's my, he, I'm, I'm innocent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, and she even, she herself said, she said he's my brother. In the honor of my heart and the purity of my hands, I have not done, I have done this. And God said to him in a dream, yes, I know that you did this in the honor of your heart. And I also withheld you from sinning against me. On account of this, I did not allow you to touch her. And now return the wife of the man, this prophet, and he will pray for you, and you shall live. And if you do not return her, know that you shall surely die. And I'm just seeing this whole picture of the Pharaoh, let my people go, and Sarah representing Israel, and the bride being redeemed from Egypt in this first case, and again here. But um, I just think it's interesting because, in, to me, it's showing that he's, he's not allowing him to sin against him. And I think that that is an act of mercy, because what we know of Abraham when he begged God about Sodom and Gomorrah, like, almost ridiculously, if there's even one, if there's even, you know, and he's like, no, I won't destroy it, no, I won't destroy it. So this is just like the kind of mentality I think Abraham has. Yeah, yeah. good insight, absolutely. Yeah. And, and I know we've been kind of hung up on this whole sister meeting the wife thing, but I found that we were looking at a lot of different scriptures, <laughs> um, like especially in Song of Solomon, that talks about, you have ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. And that's like messianic, that's about sure, you know, Messiah sure. and the bride, and he keeps calling her sister. Also, yeah. another connection in Genesis, we talked about the the Eve being brought from the side mm -hmm. of Adam. Mm -hmm. um, that word there, I'm going to go to it, it says, And Yahweh caused a deep sleep to fall on the man who slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh. That word one is a coat. Mm. He took a sister from his side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, another yeah. interesting And you know, I, and I would not necessarily, I would not personally quibble necessarily with whether Abraham actually was telling the truth regarding whether sister, sister <coughs> Sarah was his sister or not. I think the question really for me is not whether or not she was his sister, but where was his trust? Right. Did he actually make a mistake? <laughs> I think the answer to me is yes, he did. He prevaricated he did not tell the whole truth and it was his, not his intent to be truthful yeah, clearly it's but then he does it again and then he teaches his son to do it and there's never any sort of punishment there there's no mention of why are you doing this on god's behalf so it almost seems mm -hmm. like it's a mercy thing i mm -hmm. made this note too that could this also be related to the messiah telling people not to tell anyone who, mm. who he was mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I mean, if he that, made, made it known before the time that was appointed, mm -hmm. you know, he would have been killed just as Abraham and Jesus and yeah. killed. And, and then, it's not like a self-preservation thing either, I don't think, because, you know, he's trying to protect his bride ultimately. Well, I don't see it in this text, in this text anyway, because he says, you know, it shall be that they will let you live, but they will kill me. Yeah, and what will they do to her? And I'll be dead, I won't be able to protect you, and you'll be a widow. You know, I think about that as, as a picture of the bride of Israel. You know, and, and, Yah, and Messiah saying, don't tell anybody who I am. Mm. You know, I just saw a parallel, though. With yeah. that. I don't know if there no, is. I would say there's, there's, there, there's potentially a, a good parallel there. I wouldn't deny that. I just, the, my reading of this and my sense of it is that he's trying to protect himself. In a sense, you could say he's protecting Sarah, but let's say that he tells them she's my sister. Okay. <clears throat> well, what happens? He trades her. For goods that's not protecting her if he says she's my wife and he gets killed he already knows she's not going to be killed right he, he already knows she's not going to die because she's a beautiful woman they're going to kill me and take her because she's a beautiful woman I don't know that I see him protecting her 
Well, also, too, you got to think about the faith thing. For me, when I think of Abraham, I think of this man of faith. Mm -hmm. And the same way that he took Isaac up to slaughter him on the altar, he knows that Sarah is not pregnant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He trusts in this promise. Has this prom I mean, mm -hmm. God made him a promise. That's true. So to me, I kind of see it as him going, look, God made this promise. This is how it's going it, to... I don't know if he's trying yeah. to make it, uh, you know... Yeah. Work it out in his own head, but... No, I should, yeah. And I think he probably... I think you're right. That's a good point that he knew. And we see it later on when he knows this is... I got this woman... He does... It, does, it is revealed to him that it is this woman, Sarah, is going to have the child. But mm -hmm. that's not until after Hagar gives birth to Ishmael. Right. Okay, but then it's like God says, offer him up. Well, you definitely told me that the seed is coming through this boy. So that, you know, he's, his faith does have to operate there. Now, does he know that he needs to protect Sarai because she's going to be the, the seed bearer? The text doesn't say so. Could have been, in the, he, and I'm not saying he was thinking to himself, well, maybe it's not Sarai, maybe it's someone else. So, and he, I think he's definitely uh, looking out for her interests, but I just, it, it's, to me, it smacks a little bit more of looking out for his own interests. Well, More than hers. Is it possible in this whole venture that he's on that his faith isn't that strong and it just keeps growing and growing? Well, I think that's a that would be a natural way to look at it. I mean, when he is, you know, the father of our faith, that he is definitely held up as a faithful mm -hmm. example for us. But I, again, like Mike said, it doesn't mean he's perfect right coming out of the right. gate. Right. You know, yeah, he t had to take some faith steps to leave mm -hmm. his land and his father's house and his family. But I, I think uh, it would be a little weird if he didn't make some mistakes, mm -hmm. you know, because we see every, I, I mean, and that's encouraging to us. Even. Yeah, that's encouraging to us mm -hmm. then to know that we, the father of our faith is going to be mm -hmm. stumbling around a little bit. Well, that gives me some encouragement that, like I've mentioned before, a lot is mentioned as a, a big old figure of faith. I'm like, really? That's really weird. That gives me even more encouragement. Yeah, really. <laughs> but I'm sorry, Mike. Yeah, uh, no, that's... Um, anything anything else? Uh, yeah, so the, you, you had pointed out like how did Pharaoh, Pharaoh find out it doesn't really Yeah, say yeah, good one, good one. There's a couple of different places in regards to Sarah where it'll say because of mm -hmm. Sarah this was done or whatever. Mm -hmm. And the word debar, her word, yeah. because of Sarah's word, is mm -hmm. left out of the translation. Right. So it's actually because of... So because of the word of Sarai, yes, yeah, so it's possible that she actually told him. Well, yeah, he was, could, she was in his house. Yeah. In Aram. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and you know she might have let slip. Hey, man, you don't want to do yeah. this. <laughs> it, it, I'm already married. Yeah. No, she could in have. Chapter twenty. Yeah. And then he immediately realizes, oh God, I've been set up. Sure. And you know, it also occurs to me that it could have been, you remember how Laban talked about Jacob and said, I have learned through divination that uh, be, you know, God has blessed me because of you. It's certainly possible that Pharaoh's diviners could have said, why are we having all this difficulty? Well, it's because of that woman. Who said they, who was that? Who learned the divination? Laban. Laban, okay. Yeah. Uh, and also Joseph to his brothers. I mean, I think he was not being serious, at least I hope not, but he said, I have learned through divination, you know, don't you know that I am a diviner? <laughs> Where is that? Is that in the Torah? The yeah, divination? that's in chapter 39, I don't think. Don't try to learn by it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's fascinating, because I've read the story in the book of Jasher, I believe, where it, dis where it discusses the actual item he used for divination. Putting the thing into yeah. the mouth of the head of one of his enemies? Yeah, yeah I know. He used for divination, Rachel stole it or something? Yep. Yep. Is that Torah or is that Jasher? Oh, that's Torah. Torah. Well, the, the details regarding the head and putting something into the... In that's in Jasher, yeah. Yeah, that's always a fascinating thing where there's actual actual divination. Yeah, it's, that's... It's, it's not denied. No, it, no, it's, it's crazy it stuff, so yeah. wrong. Yeah, absolutely. There was just a couple other things Please. I wanted to yeah. point out. Sorry. Um, I thought it was interesting, too, Tracy and I were discussing how powerful Sarah's word seems to be. And that Abraham is like the father and Sarah is like the mother of mm -hmm, mm -hmm. all of these people. And then we started thinking about all the verses that talk about, hear the instruction of your father, do not forsake the law of your mother, listen to your father who begot you, mm -hmm. who made you, mm -hmm. and do not despise the mother when she is old. Mm -hmm. um, Sarah will be in birth in her old age. Yeah, right. 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 Good and, insight. And you just have this picture, I think, even further when we get into... 
Sarah being a representation of the word mm. as mm. Hagar is this representation of the flesh mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and how you know Abraham basically says you know deal with Hagar how you see fit and the word deals harshly with the flesh and the flesh flees that's the flesh right is told to come back and submit to the word that's a good insight it's Absolutely. Really interesting. Yeah. And, and it matches up with what Paul's talking about in Galatians 4 yes. and calling Sarah mother of us all right and we know that we are born of the word right as good as insight as yeah that's awesome mm -hmm. awesome yeah and I, I just think you know kind of uh, <clears throat> Maybe just this overall picture of we see we see Abraham who uh, his wife is in captivity, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then the wife is now given to the true husband. You see the same picture with the bride Israel being in captivity and then being brought out to the true husband. And then you see it again with the Messiah and you know the house of Israel being under captivity of the man-made traditions and then being brought to the true husband. It's just this mm -hmm. picture and perhaps these three things are also the picture of why this was done three times. Mm. And the, the letters in Sarah's name the, the same three letters are in Israel. It's, Sarah means princess mm -hmm. or something like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And Israel means to rule with God. So there's yeah. this connection to their names as well mm -hmm. yeah fascinating fascinating good stuff good stuff there's a lot of really really good insights in this section yeah. um, before it gets too late yeah go ahead just, just a little more, more to say you know the, there are parts of scripture that we are uncomfortable with like for instance in the New Testament where there's a parable of the shrewd servant where he finds he's about to get fired and he's like, oh no, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta rush. Make some deals. Make some business deals sure. so I can have a way to, so I can have further employment. So mm -hmm. he goes and he, um, he uh, you know, I, I don't quite understand what he does business wise, but he, he basically. It's like you owe my master ten thousand dollars. Let's settle accounts for a discounted yeah, fee. Exactly. At least I'll have something. Said, yeah. Well, that's you know, I, I look at that and I say, well, that's not right. But in the parable, he's congratulated. Mm -hmm. He is. Mm -hmm. um, as, as being the wise servant, mm -hmm. and we look at liars, what we would call liars. You know, in the Old Testament, <coughs> we see Abraham is a liar by our definition mm -hmm. here, and then we have Jacob is a liar, like you mentioned. You know, he, he David. Well, where does David lie? He's, he's oh. pretends to be uh, insane in front insane of insane. Okay. To save his life. Yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. Mm -hmm. And then Rahab again, someone who is rewarded. She she has had her life spared for lying yeah. about the direction the, the service went. Right. And then if you go to the Ten Commandments, there is no "thou shalt not lie." Well, it shows that thou shalt not bear false, false witness. In all those instances, I think, and it's not think the same thing. Bearing mm -hmm. false witness is a legal rule. All those mm -hmm. instances were to save lives. Like slander type thing. Right? Well, well it's it's super, it's except, it's except for system. Jacob, mm -hmm. Jacob didn't system. lie in order to save lives. So people would die oh, based on based on when he deceived his father. Oh, I see what you're so, saying. So basically, when I mean, the same they, thing came back on his own head when Laban yeah. switched out his wife. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, he got yeah he. He got hit hard he get for what he did. That. He got it done right back. That was the only thing that I'm thinking of in my mind. Yeah, there are plenty of instances in the Bible where people will lie to save life. And the and Torah, life takes precedence. Life takes precedence in certain cases, and I, I could not cases. deny that. No. But there are certain instances in the Bible where people are lying and that it's not to save life. Well, and I think the command is bearing false witness against a neighbor. Right? Yes. That's yes. Just, so. Right. Right. But neighbor could thing. be pretty broad. No. Sure. It's not the same thing as lying. What I'm saying is, I don't, uh, I don't know if Abraham is breaking the Torah here. No. And, if we, and if we want to um, make a judgment, let's go to Job and see see what he did. Mm. He punishes Egypt yeah. mm -hmm. strongly, mm -hmm. but he doesn't. But he does not punish Abraham. And is is God playing favorites? I don't think so. Yeah. I think that Good Abraham point. was righteous. Mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. God's view here. So I was just saying there are things that make us uncomfortable. Sure. But if they don't make God uncomfortable, 
Well, yeah. Know, something's got to change. Sure. It's sure. Awesome. Yeah. That's yeah. A, that's a, that, that is a good insight, that's, Nathan. That's I, I agree. That's some morality to, to his. I sure. mean, I, I'm not ready to say And I'm not, yeah, I'm not saying, yeah, I'm sure you're not <laughs> suggesting that we should lie, but, it, but you know what? But he's trying, I mean, you said to save life. Right. Yes. Well, his life, if you need Sarah, to, if you needed to practice a little deception in order to save life, well, he practiced deception in order to save his own that's life. That's what I'm saying. That's what seems a little weird. Yeah, but, but he's he been did told say, he's gonna, he's that's the true. father. He's leading the people. That's true. So how can he die? So lying to protect your own life, Maybe I understand not. that. I understand that. But it, for a leader and for a human. Yeah. Well, that is a natural. That would be a natural inclination. Natural. But Absolutely. it makes me also think of all the Christian martyrs, who would not deny Yeshua and would be willing to die right. rather than say, "I'm not a follower." But they and might you, have done some lying got, up until the point where their enemies just went. Yeah, that's we possible. Can't, like you've just seen this four or five times here, sure, but now sure. we're on your ass. It might have been different if he was standing before Pharaoh and Pharaoh yeah. said, "Deny your God." Oh, yes. Yeah. Right. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah, that's the truth. Yeah, good point. Good point. That's true. Well, this has been a challenging. It's a challenging section, and I, I appreciate the different, uh, you know, insights and, and takes on this section. I want to just, uh, you know, that we don't need to go into too much depth, but I'd like to just cover briefly some of the parallels uh, between the Exodus from Egypt and Abram's visit to Egypt right here. And I, I would just, I'll give you a couple of. Um, maybe some comparisons and contrasts that you could maybe you know listen to later in the tape or you know make notes if you want and kind of do a comparison and contrast of your own and see how this prophetic picture this shadow picture is played out but comparing Abram's going down to Egypt with the later one with his descendants we have number one there was a famine in the land of Canaan which precipitated both we have half-truths were told to the leaders of Egypt, Pharaoh and Joseph at the time. His brothers did not exactly tell the truth when they said, we are all sons of one man, one of them is left at home and one is no more. Okay. Um, the Egyptians mistreated the Hebrews. This is true in both cases. God delivered the Hebrews by great plagues. Uh, the Hebrews left Egypt with great plunder. The Hebrews left with a mixed multitude. Uh, there was strife among the Hebrews and their distant relatives upon leaving Egypt. Another kind of interesting thing. And when they left Egypt the first time here, we have a conflict set up between Abraham and Lot as soon as they leave Egypt. And when they leave Egypt the second time, we have them fighting against Amalek. Interesting, interesting thing. So those are just a couple of the comparisons that I made. Did anybody have any, any additional comparisons or contrasts that they would throw out in regards to these, these uh, two events? One more thing to mention is that um, Jesus and his family were instructed to go to Egypt. Yeah. So there's, yeah. that's also kind of a contrast here. Yeah, I was thinking so about that. trying to get away from Egypt in all these contexts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yet, one could argue, you know, Abram got something out of Egypt. So, and in the same way, Jesus was, his family, he and his family were spared mm -hmm. the wrath of the leader. Mm -hmm. They went to Egypt for safety. Right. Whereas you right. could say that, you know, Abraham, Abraham maybe went to Egypt for yeah. provision right. in this case. Right. So, sure. As the journey started in Egypt, it yeah. was all three accounts. Yeah. Right. Is it possible that, you know, you said God did not tell him to go south, that he ended up getting rich? Do you think he went there with the intention of bringing back enough to uh, provide for the people, his group, the souls? Hmm. That's an interesting idea. Yeah, Could be that he, you know, had was feeling a, com a certain compulsion to take care of the people, responsibility, the, the responsibility to the people leader. with him. Yeah, I would absolutely say yeah, that's true. He's been told to go to yeah. move, right? And right, it's not a very. Right. It makes you. I mean, this is the thing that always gets me when you, when you, I completely agree with you and understand that God will use all things towards his purpose and whatever yeah. that ultimate plan is going right. to be. But some of these things are just so 
perfectly timed out. And it makes you really wonder yeah. how much free will is involved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a difficult one, maybe, I know. Yeah, how much free will is involved here? I, we could be not much. <laughs> well, it's just a small, just a small discussion of free will versus determinism, right? Yeah. Just, just tack that on. That's right. Uh, anybody have anything else that they want to throw out for the good of the order? Um, but we'll wrap up and have some snacks. Uh, thank you. Good, good, good talk tonight. Thanks.